Chapter 1 This purports to be a muffin, Warble says as he trains his video camera at the object on his plate. You know, these fancy schmancy high-toned restaurants have been known to trick people by reverse engineering all types of foods and then introducing them in stealth varieties decked out to look like something else altogether. Take this so-called muffin, for instance. How do we know it's not really a bagel? Or a donut? Or even a filet mignon? Warble's wife, Mary, looks at him warily, ever so slightly and slowly, shaking her head from side to side. It isn't palsy that causes this rocking of her cranium. It is a mixture of exasperation and resignation that Warble, even on this special occasion at this gourmet restaurant attached to Bayfield, Wisconsin's renowned Rittenhouse Inn, won't let up on his wild theorizing. Warble sees conspiracies in everything, from the birds flying south in the winter to the Yankees winning the World Series. He claims the migration of the winged creatures to the south causes the worm population in the areas they had abandoned to multiply exponentially, which eventually leads to worms eating all the vegetation in the north, which leads, naturally, to the inhabitants of the northland pulling up stakes and moving to the south with the decided Yankeeization of Southern culture, which, for some reason known only to Warble, is a plot perpetrated by the federal government. As for the Yankees winning the World Series, Warble feels that the feds consider it better for America in the long run that baseball be displaced by football in the hearts and minds of sports fans. For that reason, government infiltrators, agent provocateurs, have not only been busy on the inside manipulating both sides to spark labor disagreements, resulting in strikes and lockouts, but also in ensuring that the Yankees win almost all of the World Series. This sameness leads to boredom, resulting in fan abandonment of baseball for a less predictable sport, football. And becoming football fans leads to the aggressivization, as Warble puts it, of the American male which is, he is confident, exactly the intention of the Washington crowd. Warble continues with his diatribe. Yes, I think they pulled the old bait and switch on me, Mary. This muffin, as they would have us think it is, is in actuality no doubt a filet mignon that has been prepared so as to resemble a muffin in contour and aroma. Indubitably, it has been cooked rare, in the hopes that I will contract some disease from the uncooked meat, die, and then they can steal into our room while you're away attending to the funeral arrangements and too distraught to realize what is happening. Once they abscond with all of our worldly goods, they will search through them until they find my notes, and then, having the wherewithal and connections needed to bring all my ideas to fruition, will amass a fortune so huge they will be able to afford to feed everyone here in Bayfield every day of the year, every year, from here into eternity, free of charge. And they would do it, too. Not out of the goodness of their hearts, oh no, but for the PR value. What a coup. It is a rather ingenious idea, I must give them that at least. While robbing valiant men like me of their treasures, the blood, sweat, and tears won ideas wrested from the writhing depths of their tortured souls, they put on a pretense of being philanthropic, and no judge or jury in the land would ever find them guilty of anything. Mary defiantly bites into the muffin on her plate. Warble puts up a hand to stop her as he records this foolish and daring act through the video camera lens. Without taking his eye from the viewfinder, he continues to provide commentary on the gastronomic scene he is recording. It tastes like a muffin to me, Mary says, gazing directly into the camera with a challenging and even downright surly expression. She gives the camera a swift slap. Would you put that thing down, Warble? You're causing a scene. It is true that several of the other guests are absorbed in the goings-on at the McGorkle table. 
Some are attempting to appear oblivious to Warble's ramblings, but are nevertheless watching the McGorkles out of the corners of their eyes and whispering to each other while furtively gesturing toward the man who is videotaping his breakfast. Others are openly gawking. A man breakfasting alone is neglecting his food and has turned his chair to face the action. He is grinning broadly, seemingly lost in reverie. Well, of course, yours really is a muffin. It's me they have a motive to kill, remember, not you, Warble says to Mary as he raises the video camera above his plate. And do you see that so-called glass of water there? That, for a certainty, is a glass of Cabernet Sauvignon. But not just your ordinary garden variety Cabernet, oh no. It is the same exact variety of varietal served to the political dissenters in Spain that induces them to lose their sanity and commit suicide by running out into the pass of raging bulls. If I drink that water and commit Harry Carey, my enemies are saved the trouble of eliminating me themselves. And when the police come to investigate our room, these rapscallions will easily bribe the peace officers with a lifetime supply of jelly-filled donuts to snatch away the meticulous and detailed notes I have kept of all my wonderful and ingenious inventions. Mary thrusts out her hand as a frog does its tongue to capture a fly, making a grab for Warble's muffin. She wants to take a bite out of it to prove once and for all that it is just a normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill muffin and put an end to all this tomfoolery. The wiry warble is too quick for her, though. He grabs the tips of her fingers just as she is about to retract the baked item to her mouth. Mary then tries to grab the muffin with her other hand, but warble encompasses the whole thing with his hand and crushes it. The muffin, not her hand. Mary angrily yanks her hand loose, and in doing so, the crumbled to smithereens muffin flies in what seems like millions of tiny globules all over the ornate carpet with which the Rittenhouse Inn's dining room is appointed. The solitary breakfaster guffaws, and the other onlookers gasp. As the server, unable to ignore the untoward proceedings any longer approaches, Warble turns and addresses him in all gravity. My good man, he says in his best stuffy British accent, not to be confused with the rough and tumble Cockney accent preferred by coal miners and the like, my wife seems to be quite fond of your muffins. Would you kindly bring her another one of her kind of muffins? When Warble says her, he arches an eyebrow to further emphasize the implication. The server opts to ignore the provocation and simply responds, Certainly, sir. And which type do you prefer, ma'am? He continues, turning to Mary. The apple cranberry or the banana nut? Mary buries her head in her hands, but spreads her fingers far enough apart to look through them and glares out at Warble. Without looking at the server, she replies in a monotone, The apple cranberry, please. As the server turns away in a manner displaying both officiousness and quiet dignity, Warble grabs him by the arm. Remember, one of her types of muffin, not one of my muffins. Again, the arched eyebrow. The server assures Warble that he knows exactly what to do. Warble returns again to his theme. Places like this are always pulling shenanigans on people like me. An innocent-looking muffin becomes a death-dealing slab of putrefied meat. A glass of pure, wholesome, unadulterated H2O gets swapped out with a potion of poisoned fruit of the vine. An idea, a brainstorm, he would term it, occurs to Warble. If I can record a testimony that this food and drink is untainted, we will have them cornered, my dear, he leans and whispers into his wife's ear. He is about to continue explaining his plan when he notices the server approaching their table and holds his tongue. Warble quickly straightens up and fixes the server in the camera's viewfinder. In a tone of warning, Warble asks him, 
Will you swear on a stack of pancakes that this, he points down with his free hand to the second unmolested muffin on his plate, is in reality a muffin and nothing but a muffin? So help you God. The server is at a loss as to how to respond to this bizarre interrogation. He looks around to locate the restaurant manager, hoping he will notice his predicament and come to his aid. The manager is observing the unusual goings-on from around the corner. When the server and manager establish eye contact, though, the manager just shrugs as if to say, You deal with it. Let's see how you do. 